<laughs> What's that? I know Teresa's talking. We'll wait for her to be finished. <laughs> we're talking about the parade of tongues, sir, that we were representing out at Sarah. Great. That's awesome. I'm glad you did that. Uh, no. You know, that just it's a good sign of getting outside and doing things to drum up business. Right? Well, I think all three were cash. Okay. We heard about all the trust funds. I heard about all the trust funds. So thank you guys for taking the time out to be here. As we said with our leadership element meeting we had earlier today, you can fake Karen, but you can't fake showing up. Showing up means you're here to get better. How many of you believe you actually can get better? Most of you. I can tell the people who don't believe that they can get better because they're not here. All right, that says a lot about commitment to improve. All right, showing up and having the humility to realize that you need a coach, that you need somebody to push you to heights that you can't get to on your own. Showing up and having the humility to realize that you aren't all already, right? You've got room to grow. We talk about EOS. I won't put any of you on the spot in terms of EOS just yet, just yet. But I, it did, it did um, strike me over the weekend that sometimes we have to look at our EOS about ourselves and our ability to influence people. In other words, we think about our EOS in terms of, you know, what do we believe about what we do? But what do we believe about ourselves? Because I think oftentimes what we believe about ourselves leads to greater and greater things or it doesn't. See, if you believe that you can get better and you believe you can influence people and you can believe that you can help more and more people by putting yourself out there in vulnerable situations like generating referral partners and getting business outside of the phone, you can. And if you believe that you can't or fear gets in the way of you doing those things that you're coached to, you're right. See, whether we believe we can or we can't is true. So if you believe you've got hurdles in your business right now that are preventing you from growing, you're probably right. You probably do. And you're allowing those hurdles to keep you stagnant. But if you believe that those are simply just roadblocks for you to blow over and continue to push forward, and that you believe that you can grow and you can change your business with the changing tides of our industry because it requires consistent and constant development, Right? We are in a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of environment. Consistency is king. And if you believe those things are true, then you're poised to succeed. But if you believe in the excuses that you hear, you're poised to not go anywhere. See, that's all they are is excuses. Everybody's got them. We let them into our life way too often. And they just keep us right where we're at but they're lies. One of the things we're going to go through today with Coach, um, we're going to go through a lot of things. We're going to end with some written commitments. So here's the deal. If you don't have something to write with, shame on you. Go get something to write with and write on. Everybody's got something. That's good. Because we're going to ask you to write down some things that you're committed to doing. Because without actually Writing them down, they're just a hope or a wish. And while every now and then hopes and wishes do come true, we don't live in a fantasy world. We live in a world where work generates results and intention generates results, not hoping and wishing. And so we're going to write down our intention. We're going to write down what we're committed to do in terms of our work. And we're going to share it with people because we're going into what could be and what typically is for most people a slow season. Because most salespeople allow that myth to be an excuse for them. Great people call it what it is, which is a lie, and simply make commitments to do different work that produces better results during that season. You guys are going to be those people. Coach? All right, good morning. You use the word commitment. Um, here's what I would tell you. The low ordinance thinker won't be entertained. 
They want new content every month. I hear this a lot. Well, I've already heard Coach Burt talk about this. I've already heard Coach Burt talk about that. The high ordinance thinker wants mastery. And there's a big difference between to be entertained and wanting to master something. Everybody see what I'm saying? Because mastery is boring. Mastery is repetition. Mastery is over and over. So I look at the people that are earning the most money of who I coach, right? Because I'm coaching all these mortgage people in real estate. People who are earning half a million dollars and above, I have been their coach for over three years. And do you know how many times I've talked about working a hit list? <laughs> they, they could get up here and teach my content back to you. So why do they keep coming back after they've already heard it before? Because there's a difference in how they think. They think in terms of, I'm going to master this. The average cat thinks of, you know, I, we, I really wish he'd entertain me a little bit different this month than he did last month. See the difference between these two things? So I want you to get in your mindset that mastery is not sexy. It ain't even fun. It's sometimes boring, but it is through pure repetition of something that you do something over and over and over. And you, you become so good at it that you have a certainty about you. And that's really what you're selling. You're selling certainty. You're selling that you can overcome my fear and anxiety, and that's why I'm going with you. Now, some people are going to call that confidence, but, but because I've been coaching for 25 years, I have, I have a certainty about me. If you follow what I'm teaching you to do, you'll produce more. If you don't, you won't, right? And I'm certain of it. I'm certain of it because I've seen it happen so many times. And I've got enough quantitative data to say, these are people that have done it, and here's what they've done. Here's people that haven't done it, and here's what they've done. So what you're selling is a certainty. So how do I get that certainty as a, as a home loan specialist? Where does that come from? Where does the level of certainty come from? Because I've got fear. Fear is an unpleasant emotion that I have that is created by a belief that something's going to create harm for me in the future. So I've got a fear. What, what, what would the fear be in the mind of a borrower? Yeah, rejection, not close on time. But there's a lot of other fears too. Can I afford the payment? Can, you know, what have I done? These are all fears that a person buying a new house has. I'm leaving the house I love for this. I went through that with my, myself. I mean, I love my old house. And I actually had fear and anxiety out of moving out of one house to another when the new one was much better than the old one. I remember sitting on the patio going, telling my wife, I don't know if we can. I love this house. And she's like, are you kidding me? This house is so much better than this house. But I had all these emotional feelings about the house because I designed it. I lived there. It, right, right? So, so what about a real estate agent? What uncertainty do they have? Because they got uncertainty too. See, see, here's the problem. I'm not leaving who I'm with to come to you unless I have more certainty. And the only way you're going to give me more certainty is through more information. If I'm not pulling the trigger with you and taking action with you, it's because there's something that I've got a fear. Fear of what? What do I fear? I fear that I'm going to turn over my customer to you and you're not going to handle them appropriately. Fear that you're not going to get the loan done on time. Fear that's going to be a bad experience. Fear, right? Fear that you're not going to answer the phone when I depend on you. So the reason I don't act with you or leave who I'm with is because i got certainty with them and I don't have certainty with you. Okay? So I tell my sales team, and let me give an example. We, we were working on a guy in New York City, wanted me to coach him, wanted me to coach his team, insurance guy, and we had multiple conversations with him. And for some reason, he was still uncertain. Now, my sales guy comes to me and says, Coach, I don't know how, how to give him this information any other way. I, I can't, he must be slow. I don't understand why he don't get it. He was putting all of it on him. And I said, no, no, no. You got to take it back on you because there's something that he's uncertain about. I said, have you, have you given it to him in video? No. Have you had our best customer call him? No. Have you given it to him in audio? Nope. Have you put one of our other salespeople on the phone with him? Nope. I said, well, you haven't given it to him in multiple ways then, have you? Because the way you're giving it to him, I don't care if I'm feeding you a, uh, 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 a short dose of vegetables, you ain't eating them. Okay? you you got to find another way to get his attention. So the only way you, I can give you certainty is if I got certainty. The only way I got certainty is through consistent, consistent, ongoing repetition to where I am so talented at what it is I do. I'm talking about you. 
that, man, you, you could turn these babies over to me and nobody can do this better than me. I'm a specialist, not a generalist. But that's what you got to know. Right now you're working on people and they're not coming to you because they still got uncertainty. There's something you're not doing that's communicating to them. Now, let me give you another example. I'm selling two long-term real estate properties right now. The real estate agent I'm using calls me every morning to tell me what he's doing and calls me at the end of every day to tell me what he did. Every single day. Does that give me more certainty, yes or no? Here's what we're working on today. Here's what we did today. Here's what we'll be working on tomorrow. Every single day. That gives me a level of certainty. You know what I know? He's on it, man. So how do I overcome uncertainty to you? I give you more information. I give you more consistent information. And if your real estate agent's sitting there going, I hadn't seen enough to make a decision yet, okay, then you haven't given them enough information about how you can overcome that fear in them yet. And that's on you. It ain't on them, okay? So today what we're going to talk about is a couple things. We're going to talk about your attitudinal uh, instrument, i.e., what type of attitude are you bringing to the equation? Because I see a lot of very... Uh, agitated, irritated LOs. <laughs> and, and it's kind of a way of life. Right, Matt? It's like they live in a state of frustration. And you know why you live in a state of frustration? Because a lot of your future is in the hands of other people. And, and you're, you know, one of my sayings is never, leave, never put your destiny in the hands of another person. <laughs> but in business, you kind of have to, right? Oh, I kind of have to too because I got an operations team. But, but I tell people, if you sell it and you're on my team, here's what I tell you. It's your responsibility. If you want to continue to get a commission, because we pay out on a drip commission, I say, if you want to continue to get paid, you better, you better, no matter what our operation person does, you better stay in touch with that customer. Right? That's what I tell my salespeople. If you want to continue to get that commission, it's your responsibility when you sign them up to stay with them and love on them. So you, because when they stop paying, you stop getting paid. So they'll tell me, you're right, coach. Never let another person stand between me and my destiny. That's right. It's your commission. It's your family. It's your future. Right? It ain't mine. It's yours. Well, it is mine, too, because I get paid on it, too. So we're in this boat together, right? But here's what, I'm t here's what I'm telling them. What if the operation person drops the ball? What if they don't do what they're supposed to? What if they're overwhelmed? What if they didn't call them back? What, right? You take total responsibility for that, total ownership of this. Okay? So today we're going to talk about your attitudinal at mindset. You know, in a, in a plane, it has an attitude indicator. And when it's ascending, it's above the line. When it's descending, it's below the line. But we kind of have an attitude indicator, too. So let me ask you this. Do you think the mortgage originators who have the best attitude get the most opportunity? You think that's a true statement or false statement? Do you think the ones that, 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 are, that are the best to deal with get the most opportunity? Yes. So sometimes, how many of you have ever been in a spot where you said, I need an attitude adjustment? You personally said that. Look, man, I got a pitiful attitude right now. Well, last week I was on vacation in Seaside, Florida. Beautiful place. We had a beautiful house. It's a great laid-back place, you know, good, clean living. Everybody's vacay. Everybody's running and biking and, and living in nice houses. And, and, well, the whole time I was down there, I was incredibly frustrated because my business was not working like it was supposed to work. So although I was supposed to be on vacation, I didn't get to vacate at all last week. And so here's, here's what I woke up and felt. I was agitated. I was irritated, I was frustrated, and I was not enjoying myself at all. And, and, and now, when I had that bad attitude, how do you think that affected everybody else in the house? It was actually very selfish on my part. You know why? They spent all their time worrying about me. Did your audience know? What do you mean, my audience? Whoever were down there. Oh, yeah, they knew it, because they were in the same place yeah. with me. So they spent all their time worrying about me. What's wrong with you? Why are you so irritated? Why are you so agitated? And here's the problem. I couldn't fake it. Like I was trying to snap myself out of this bad attitude, but I was mad. I was mad at my business. I was mad at my team. I was mad at crazy customers we had. I was mad at all kinds of things. And for a whole week, this is it. I just had a bad attitude, which really sucks because I was on vacation. Right? So I didn't actually relax until I got home from vacation. Then I needed a vacation from my vacation. So, so, I, so but, but over the weekend, I was spending some time reflecting on my heart. And why did I have this bad attitude? Because I'm a positive person. I listen to positive things every day, read positive books, give positive messages, write positive books. Why did I have such a crappy attitude, right? And I began thinking about you. Like, why, when you have a bad attitude, why, why are you having a bad attitude? So here's what I began to figure out. I said, man, we're growing at a rate of 206%.
Why am I so upset? How many of you are grown, but you're still upset? You're, you're making progress, but you're still my anger, right? Okay. Number two, here's what I said. My little machine ain't working like it's supposed to. Remember last month when we did Million Dollar Machine? We were looking at our business. We said something ain't working right. The leads, leads ain't working right. My follow-up is not working right. My referrals are not working right. Something about this machine is not functioning properly, which is creating this stress and friction on me, and I'm unhappy about it. Now, here was a big, here was a big one that, that caused me a lot of stress is between the, I was having an internal battle between who, who I want to be versus who I actually am. By nature, I'm not always a positive person. I can be negative. By nature, I, I, right? But I want to be a positive person. By nature, I want to be this. But what was happening was the stress and pressure of my business trying to hit these numbers was causing me to be drug into a very transactional person. Everybody with me? So I was beginning to be transactional with my team. I was beginning to be transactional with my customers because I was trying to hit this big number up here and I was just pushing this machine so hard that I actually was losing touch with the person I wanted to be. Okay? And that was creating this internal battle in me. Like, I want to be this, but why am I this? Like, I want to be more compassionate, but I'm not being compassionate. I want to be this, or I want to be positive, but I'm not being positive, right? And it was like, it was just a machine. So what about this one? He's not responding like I want to be. That was creating stress. I can't get away from this monster I've created. Anybody ever felt that way in the mortgage business? I've created a monster and I can't get away from it. I can't even go on vacation and get away from it. It's always there. And I had a, one of my buddies once say, you're going to do so much stuff. Or you're going to practice all the stuff you preach and you're going to wake up one day and you're actually going to hate your business. Because you're going to have so much business that you actually resent it. You know what I told him? Nah, come on, man. It's crazy. I ain't never going to resent growth. Well, the more customers you get, the more problems you got. And you start going, man, what have I created? I've created a freaking monster here. Okay? So, so how do I deal with that? And then I begin looking like, how do I get out of this monster that I've created? What do I do? What do I leverage? So, so this, was how, this is what put me in a bad attitudinal state. Everybody with me? All of these things right here. So you can ask yourself what puts you in a bad attitude state. Because... Bad attitude state, listen, you're not going to attract people to you. You're actually going to repel people from you and because they're going to feel that energy. Now, so what I did is I began to, un, I'm going to come back to this fear and uncertainty. Here's what I began to do. I needed to go back and begin to write out some things. I began to write out what I believe, why I believed it. Okay, I began to write out, like, like, like I need something to remind me of positive things, okay? And so I began to write, now why did I get into this business to begin with? Why did you get into this business to begin with? I began to remind myself that I need to get out of living in this perfectionism gap because it ain't going to be perfect. I need to start measuring progress. I need to get out of, I need to reframe my expectations of other people. I need, I need to start thinking, hey, if I can get them to 80%, I need to start un expecting the unexpected. I need to grow my bounce back. These are all things that I began to tell myself. I began to write these things out. Well, I got into this business because I believe this, and I believe this, and I'll show those to you in a second. But what happened is that began to change my attitude. And I said, look, i got to make some shifts here because I'm not the guy I really want to be here. Okay? And somewhere along the way, I've kind of lost that identity. And then last night, I was doing some, doing some study, and I was like, well, what, who do I look to for a, perfect, for a good attitude? Where, where, like, like, give me an example of a good attitude. And then I found this. I just went straight to the Bible. I said, what, 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 what does the Bible say about attitude? What does it say about attitude? Jesus' attitude has never become defensive, discouraged, depressed, because he had one goal, one, one dominant focus. That was to please the Father. Then, then here's what really was good. In the midst of trial, he was patient. In the midst of suffering, he was hopeful. In the midst of blessing, he was humble. In the midst of ridicule, abuse, hostility, he made no threats. He did not retaliate. That's a pretty good attitude, right? It would be hard for me to have that attitude. But if I could have that attitude... Man, how attractive would that be to other people? This is kind of a good standard, right? But, but what happens is we become negative. We become cynical. How many of you have become cynical toward the mortgage business? Just cynical toward the mortgage business. What do you get mad at? Loyalty? Hey, there's no loyalty. I hear this all the time from mortgage Ridger. No loyalty. Okay? We got a much better product, much better process. Why can't they see that? There's all of these things that make you cynical. And then what happens is you just become this negative person. And so every time I'm around you, I hear these negative things. One of the negative things is 
the, the world slows down at the end of the year. Nobody buys a house from, from Thanksgiving till January. I hear all of these things, right? You already had real estate agents start telling you that, haven't you? Hey, I'm noticing a slow down here. And when a person is scared, here's what they do. So here's what happens. This is what you're trying to overcome as a salesperson. And as a leader, as a mortgage leader. Two things. I got fear and I've got uncertainty. Now, last week, let me, let me show you some fear that I had. Last week, I stroked a check for $100,000. And, and, and I'm speaking at a conference where 10,000 people are going to be at in Las Vegas at Mandalay Bay. And I'm scheduled to speak with some of the biggest people in the world. Damon John from Shark Tank. Uh, Lewis Howes from the School of Greatness. All of these big time people. And this is like a huge moment in my life to be on a stage with these people. 10,000 people, Mandalay Bay Arena. And so the way this worked is, I told the person who put the conference on, I'd like to help you. I don't want to mooch off of you. Let me help you. So what I'll do is I'll buy $100,000 worth of tickets. Because he stroked a check for $4 million for this arena. So I said, let me help you as part of one of the speakers, and, and I'll buy $100,000 worth of tickets. So I wrote a check for $100,000. And I said, I'll turn around and sell those tickets to my people. I'll put it in a package, and I'll turn around and sell it. And, and we've sold 30, 40 of these tickets. And, uh, but, but then I'm, I'm on vacation, and I wake up, and the first thing I see is this news feed. Massacre, 50 people dead. The shooter is on the, you know, whatever floor of what hotel? Mandalay Bay. Exactly where I'm supposed to be in a few months. I just wrote the check for 100000 bucks two days earlier. And I'm sitting there, and the very first thing in my mind is, oh, my gosh. Are people going to want to go? Are they even going to have the conference? Are we going to lose all this money? I mean, I'm going through all this fear and anxiety after doing this. You, you, you with me here? And, I, and I'm sitting there going, man, why? Because there's uncertainty. There's all this uncertainty happening, right? And so I'm like, well how, well, how do I handle it? Do I address it? Do I not address it? Do I say something? Do I not say something? Do we keep going? Do we not keep going? You know, there's all these things that are going on. Well, this is natural. From a time we're a little baby, we're, we're, we, we're, we're born, and what do we do? What, what do our parents tell us? Don't touch this. Don't do that. Be careful. Don't run fast. Don't talk to strangers. So from an early age, we're in a state of fear. Fear breeds uncertainty. When I have uncertainty, guess what I don't do? I don't take action. I contract. I retreat. I just sit, which is exactly what people do when you haven't overcome their uncertainty as a salesperson. And so I made a decision. Look, we got we to gotta move forward, you know. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to do except move forward. I've already committed, and I'm committed to doing this, and I've already, I, I'm in. I, so we're going to do it, right? And here's what I noticed. Some people said, look, we're going, I'm going. Don't matter. That, this could happen anywhere in the world. I'm not going to let that stop me from going forward, right? But I had to kind of psych myself up and come, overcome this fear. And the way I overcome fear in my life is I take action. Everybody with me? The last 90 days of the year, during this 90-day burn, you know how you overcome this uh, slump? Not, you know what you do? You take action. You take a lot of action. You take more action than you typically would. You create more things. Both create one thing in action. Does everybody see how the people who are not going with you, who are not taking action with you, is because they don't have certainty about you? Everybody see that? The way you give them certainty is you have certainty. And you feed them more information. And you, you don't put it on them and say, well, why haven't you seen enough to make a decision? Why can't you figure out that Churchill's better than this company? Say, obviously you ain't seen enough to make a decision. I need to keep giving you some more information. Maybe I need to give it to you this way. Maybe I need to give it to you this way. Maybe I need to give it to you in a video. Maybe I need to have this person. But some, for some reason, you're hesitant about moving forward. And it's my job to overcome this. Yes, you want to say something? Now, here's some stats that Doug gave me this morning that the Stratmore Group come up with. Now, this is interesting as it relates to loan originator productivity. 70, 73%, look at the high numbers this is. 73% of LOs don't have a daily regiment. Uh, and time priority plans, 73%. That means they come into the day with what? No plan whatsoever. 94% of LOs don't follow a day's daily business plan. Now, at the end of today, I'm going to try to get you to take certain actions. Okay? And my rhythm is this. I call five of my clients a day. I call on five people that are interested in my services. 
I call on three of my biggest clients. I take certain actions every day. Everybody with me? It don't matter if I feel like it or not. F feelings or emotions. Just because feelings are real, they don't make them right. So it don't matter if I feel like calling them. That's what I do every day because I'm committed to mastery, okay? 91% don't have a consistent month-over-month, -month, uh, don't have consistent month-over-month -month funding volume. 91%. So that means their business is what? Like this. You know why? They won't commit to a process. Selling is a game of probability. The way I increase probabilities is by taking certain actions every day. So I've committed to two hours of call-outs every day. Two hours of phone time every day. Do I like getting on that phone every day? No. Do I feel like getting on that phone every day? No. Do I want to call on new people every day? No. The, the answer to that is no on all of them. But what am I committed to? I'm committed to mastery. And the way you master something is through, right? You have 10 critical conversations every day, you'll master the phone. You'll master selling. 87% have, have not received a commitment from referral partners for weekly referrals, commitment to, together. So 87% have not, don't really have a commitment from their referral partners to send referrals. So, so there's really no back and forth, right? There's, I'm not in with them, okay? 82% don't have planning meetings to develop their partners. 75% are not asking weekly lead generation questions or seeking from their partners. 75% not even asking for referrals, okay? 74% do not feel effective on the phone. Okay, now that phone is really talented, but you know one thing it won't do? <laughs> it will not call out on itself by itself. It'd be a good invention if you make your cold calls for you. Okay, 78% don't feel effective with face-to-face -face consultation. Now, if I don't feel effective in my face-to-face, -face, guess what I won't do? I won't get face-to-face -face with people. Okay, 84% don't feel comfortable with borrower presentations, and 70% do not feel comfortable handling objections. Now, when it comes to objections, I want you to write this down because this is really good. There's four things you need to do when you get an objection. Number one, you need to listen. Which sounds simple, but it ain't simple. Number two, you need to acknowledge. And I'll explain these in a second. Number three, you need to isolate the objection. And number four, you need to validate. And let me tell you why. Most people, when they give you objection in selling, are lying. They're not telling you the truth about why they're not going with you. And, and if you're ever going to overcome the objection, what do you got to do? You got to find out what the real objection is. So, let's say I pitch you my services... And you say, well, I need to think about it. Okay, well, I need to think about it. This is good. It's really good. You and I believe the same things. We're on the same page. But I need to think about it. The way you isolate that objection is you say, other than you just having to think about this, is there any other reason that would prohibit you from moving forward with me? And then they may say, well, got a lot of loyalty to this person. Right? Or I don't have certainty that you can get loans done on time. Or I've heard bad things about you. you. You see what I'm saying? See, the first objection they gave me was not the real objection, was it? I just need to think about it. When I pin them down like that, like, like I hear this a lot. I've got to talk to my husband about it. I've got to talk to my wife about it. Here's what I say. So if your wife gives you approval, you're ready to take action with me. Is that right? And they'll go, well, you know, the money... So, so that really wasn't an objection. The real objection was the money. They just told me the wife. So I say, is there any other reason, is there anything else outside of this one reason you're giving me that would prohibit you from taking action? I'm isolating the objection. Okay? Then, then when, so I acknowledge it. Okay, I understand. Is there anything else that would keep you from moving forward? This one thing? Okay, so if, the, if you had certainty about this one thing, you're telling me you'd take action, right? And I just continue to move through my process. And then when I validate it back to them, I, I say, okay, if we get this one thing solved, you'll, you, you'll commit to me, right? Yes, I will commit. Okay, great. Now we know what the objection is. Now I listened to it and I acknowledged it. I isolated it and I challenge people. And what I mean by that is when I'm validating them, I'll repeat back to them what they said and I'll say, now, 
but you're really kind of looking at this all wrong, right? I mean, you told me that you were very unhappy with the originator that you're with. You told me that's been kind of rocky. You told me that it was a passive experience. That's what I've heard you say. Why in the world would you still want to stay with them if all of this is true, right? I challenge them. And some people are not that good, but if you have certainty about you, you should be able to challenge a person, shouldn't you? Yes or no? See, so I challenge them. Now, when you get that objection, the objection is basically saying, I'm uncertain. I'm uncertain about you. There's something about you I'm not certain about. My number one job is to overcome that uncertainty. My certainty. Okay? And my confidence. And I'm going I'm, I'm to have this contagious confidence about me. Okay? Now, how many of you feel like there's a person on the fence with you right now and the biggest deal is they're just uncertain about something about you, right? They're uncertain about you or they're uncertain about Churchill. You haven't given them enough information. So you've got to find a new way to give it to them. Okay? Now, when you get in a funk... I wrote down my personal beliefs. So I got in this funk. I got a bad attitude. And I go, how do I get myself out of this bad attitude? Well, let me spend time writing down what it is I actually believe. Does this turn, go back to the EOS, yes or no? You see, if you've got customer or strategic partners right now that are creating stress for you, you know why? You don't believe the same things. You believe this, and they believe this. And that's a problem for you, okay? So here's what I said I believe. I do believe everybody needs a coach. I do believe a house, the, a house is, uh, there, there, there's a difference between a house and a home. I believe a house is made up of sticks and bricks, a home is made up of memories. I do believe every person deserves a right to have a professional represent them when they do a mortgage. I do believe there's a significant difference between some mortgage companies and other mortgage companies. Okay? These are things I believe. I believe we all have missing structures. I believe we can't see the picture inside the frame. I believe in the potential and power of people. I believe that business should serve my life, not run my life. I believe that work should be the distribution channel for my talents. These are all things I'm writing out to get myself out of this funk. What else? I believe our job is to create environments that other people can thrive in. I believe in training every day to increase the capacity of my team. Let me ask you this question. If you really believe in debt-free home ownership, if you really believe that, would it not be true that even after I get in, after I, you've put me in a home, that there should be some type of mechanism that you help me achieve that debt-free home ownership? Yes or no? If you really believe that, this should not be you put me in the home and say, I believe in debt-free home ownership. Now, good luck to you. It should be, I'm going to be right here with you, structuring and, and guiding and helping you achieve what we started together. Because we both believe the same things. Okay? See, one of the things we're going to work on at the retreat is we're going to work on two things that I think you guys need more than anything. Seven-touch system when a person indicates interest and a follow-up after you put them in a home. I think we need to give that to you. I think we need to say, here's what you need to do. <laughs> right now, I know what the first objection is going to be, which is what? Dan, what's it going to be? To, the, uh, to those things. Seven-touch system. I can't work a seven-touch system when a person's indicated and using us because I'm too busy. busy. Can't follow up with my customers once I put them in a home because I'm what? Too busy. I don't have the time to do that. You're asking me to get the loan, service the customer, and do all this? Well, we got to come up with a way because you're losing money in those two areas. Wouldn't you agree? You're losing money in the follow-up, and you're losing money after you home. Those are two areas where we're all losing money, okay? So, so what else do we believe? I believe we got to feed the sheep. I believe I'm a specialist. Here's a big one I believe. I believe money only changes hands when problems are solved. The bigger the problem, the more money people solve it. I was with a real estate agent last week. He was selling houses in Jackson, Tennessee, 21000 bucks. <laughs> You say, man, such a little blue gill problem. He bundled 38 houses together and made a $1.8 million sale to an investor in Nashville. And he came to me and he said, I've heard your talks about blue gill, coach. Look at how I turned a little blue gill into blue marlin. People are in Nashville are buying houses in Jackson, Tennessee for $21,500, renting those houses for $800 a month. One investor bought 38 houses at one time for $1.8 million. That took that real estate agent from number 50 to number 15 in the Jackson market. <laughs> it's all relative. You understand what I'm saying? So when I say money only changes hands when problems are solved, the better you are solving problems, the more money you make. He figured out how to solve a problem for somebody. I mean, I look at it and go, who's going to buy a $21,000 house in Reagan, Tennessee? Somebody is, especially if they make 800 bucks a month off of it. Somebody's interested in that. So, so I believe all of these things, okay? So when you're thinking about this, 
I believe if I'm tired, they're three times as tired. I believe my job is to get them to operate the highest level possible. I can't give away what I don't possess. So here would be my question. What do you believe? If you're in an attitude funk right now, what do you believe about the mortgage business? Because if you believe it's a tired, old business, the business model's not working, it's exhausting, that's, that's your attitude. Maybe it's time you readjust your attitude. So let's shift here to the last 90 days of the year. If I said, I want to see your plan for the last 90 days of the year, how many people typically show a downward trajectory in their business the last 90 days? If you look back over your last three or four years, how many people have seen a little bit of a drop? Some of y'all are shaking your head, right? So if I know that, going into the last 90 days, what, how, how can I stimulate my own economy? Let's say you're coaching me, and I come to you and I go, man, last 90 days of the year, man, I've looked back over the last three or four years, and my business has, has begun to drop. What would you tell me I need to do if I said, look, I want to stimulate this thing to, to get across the finish line, but I also want to start next year on fire. What would you tell me I need to do? Okay. Would you, overall, would you tell me I need to increase something? Yes or no? Yeah, you may say, look, i got to increase something. So here's what I've created the last 90 days of the year. I want you to think of this. I've been calling it a 90-day burn. Because a lot of people can't commit to something long term, but they can commit to something short term. So, so here's what I want you to think about. Here's a 90-day burn. It's a concentrated period of time in your originator business, okay, that you're going to commit to taking certain actions, okay? It's an attempt to stimulate your own economy. It's an attempt to create sales, okay? And it's a time to build momentum. So, so here's some things I want us to think about. And this is what Matt's telling you, that he wants a written commitment out of you. He wants you to share that commitment with your manager and with one of your accountability partners. I'm going to give you some suggestion. And at first, you may look at this and go, man, it's a lot of stuff to do. Everything I give you, I'm personally doing myself. Because I don't want to ever be hypocritical. I'm going to try to do everything I'm telling you to do. The way I do it is I put it in my planner every day and I take action on it. So here's a rhythm I want you to think about. Number one, could you and would you have five calls out to current clients every day? This is my goal. Every day I try to call five people, five clients, current clients. Okay, and I try to just create some kind of value, which means I need to have a little bit of meditation, think about them, how can I help them, what can I bring them. But my goal is to get five a day in. Just touch it. One of the typical questions I ask a current client is, hey, has this been valuable for you? Who else do I need to be helping? Okay? I ask a, a physician in Houston, Texas, I, I coach. I'm coming to Houston next week. Who else do I need to be helping? He said, coach, I'm going to have a private event at my house, about 20 of my friends. I got 20 referrals. I'd ask him one question. Who else do I need to be helping in Houston? Let me help you. Let me fight for you there, okay? I make five outbound calls to potential new people on my hit list daily. <coughs> And I typically do this in a two-hour block, by the way. So typically, I'll take two hours a day. This is what I'm doing. I'm making outbound calls to my current clients. Now, I want you to think about this. Your green dot calls in HBM, those are hit list calls. Would you, would you agree? They're not farm club calls until you've had a conversation with them and qualified them. Once you've had a conversation and qualified them, then they're in your farm club. Then we're going how many touches? 7 to 15, if you're interested in them. But they start on the hit list. So if you said to me, where do I get these people to call? My hit list always consists of one of four people. Um, new business, current clients to ask for referrals, past clients, or strategic partners. That's where my hit list comes from. Or the leads that are coming in through our online system. Everybody, everybody with me? I don't, I don't have a HBM or, or any, you know, like some people have Boomtown. I don't have any of those things. So i got to self-generate my own leads. So what I do is I create things to give away. Those leads come in, and then now i got new people to call on. Everybody follow me? So I give away something, generate leads, call, outbound calls. I also make five calls to those in my farm club and a commitment to go new touches. Now, let's say your only is phone call. 
Your only methodology is, is phone call. It's too narrow in its scope. You need video. You need audio. You need, I mean, we're getting so creative with our follow-up now. We're even, we're, we're even, we're even having voice over people do, do, do stuff for us. I mean, you know, it cost me 250 bucks to have a person do a voiceover. Okay, now, what do, you, what do I mean by that? I'm going to see if I can find it while I'm, while I'm talking to you here. So when you're thinking about this, when you're thinking about this concept, make so many notes here. here here's, here's a, here's a follow-up we're using today. I had a guy do a voiceover for me. And all I'm trying to do is spark a little bit of creativity in your mind. Quit thinking of the only way I got to follow up with you is via phone call. Email, text message. So I went to a voiceover guy, and I said, create some great MP4s I can use when our sales team follow up with people. So he went back there. Here's what he created. Now imagine get this in your text message. Now, we've been using this as a follow-up tool. What am I trying to do? Mix it up. I'm trying to create, right? All, all, what, what's the purpose of the follow-up? To, re, to rekindle what? Yeah, the initial attraction with each other. If our initial attraction was energy, and you said, man, I like his energy. Can I like an LO per, LO's energy? Yes. This is the number one thing I liked about that guy was his energy. The number one thing I liked about that guy was his certainty. The number one thing I liked about that person was their professionalism. What I'm trying to do is figure out a way to reconnect that with you. So how can I do it? Video, audio. I'm trying to find any way I can to get your attention. So too many people are just too, they're not creative enough in the follow-up. It's like call, call it, right? I got an insurance guy calls me every week. 8 o'clock on Monday morning trying to sell me more life insurance. Every Monday morning. Same pitch. Coach, you need some more life insurance. Coach, you need this. I mean, I want to call him at like 758 and go, I, I'm not interested, man. I know you're going to call me. I know you're going to call me in two minutes. Let me just go and tell you right now I'm not interested. Okay? It, same way, same tool, same mechanism. So here's the commitment. Five calls to people in my farm club. What I'm trying to do is close five people a day. Does everybody have enough leads in their pipeline for that? Yes or no? Okay, some of you saying yes, some of you saying no. If you've got enough leads in your pipeline, I'm trying every way in the world to generate that. So every day, what am I doing? Calling on five of my current clients, calling on five hit list people, calling on five farm club people, and okay, three call outs to my top 25. Hey, what's going on? How can I help you? Right? Pushing. Then I'm trying to do showcase events, which are these things where we bring people together for energy. Okay? Commitment to work my database weekly, push out to my database. Uh, a reason to call out, that means I'm trying to create and think of reasons to call out to my sphere. Okay, now let me give you an example. Sometimes I buy short-term real estate, but I've been hesitant to buy short-term real estate in the Nashville market because of the Airbnb policies that are changing. Okay, I've made that statement to no telling how many real estate agents, no telling how many mortgage originators. One real estate agent, Christy Wilson, owns the Wilson Group. Sent me an email this week and said, Coach, I know you're interested in buying short-term real estate. Metro Council met this past week. Let me tell you exactly where they are in the process. Let me tell you what they're doing. Hopefully, this will give you a little certainty if you want to buy real estate in Nashville. Everybody with me? One. All that was was a reason for her to reach out to me. See, she, she listened to my coaching, and I tell people, look for a reason to call out to your people. So if you follow me, I create things. This 90-day burn I've created just gives me a reason to call on people. That's all I, I, so I look for any old reason that, that'll give me a reason to reach out to my base of followers and touch them. Hey, have you thought about this? That's why I write the blogs. That's why I write the database. That's why I create the shows. I'm looking for a reason to stay involved in your life 
and dominate that mind share, okay? And increase social media and a commitment to write a blog per week. Now, out of this, what I want you to take up second to do, and this is your commitment, your written commitment, what are you willing to commit to as far as how you're going to stimulate your economy? Here's some examples. You don't have to use my examples, but I do want you to, to write out every week, this is what I'm willing to do. Because you're going to have to share this with your man. I'm giving you what I do. You don't have to do all of that, but I do want you to commit to what you're going to do. Okay? Now, I want to I want to close this session by 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 making a statement to you. I want to hopefully shake it up a little bit with you. The biggest disease I see in this country is is complacency. And complacency is a gradual settling to a place of mediocrity. And I hear this a lot from real estate teams. Well, my guys or girls are doing two deals a month. They're completely comfortable with two deals a month because two deals a month, 24 deals a year. The average real estate agent only does seven to 10 deals a year. And, and I just can't get them to do any more than that. Okay? And I'm sitting there thinking, two deals a month. I mean, is that your life's ambition, is just to get to two deals a month? Right? I want you to think about that. Because at some point, complac there's a difference between being content with what you have and being complacent. And complacency really is, you have a whole lot more in the tank, but you're not exerting enough force and energy toward activating it. Okay? And so you're really not driving this potential. You're just kind of satisfied. Well, it's very hard to move a satisfied person. I always say satisfied needs never motivate, only unsatisfied needs. So an unsatisfied need is I'm not comfortable with where I am. There's another level for me to get to. i got some more force and energy to get there. And the only person who can do that is me. Okay? This is a map over the last 90 days of the year for you to just, you know, not, not live in fear and uncertainty. Not, not live in fear and uncertainty. I, you know, I want to cr stimulate my own economy versus be be, versus be, be, be hostage by an outside economy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit to mastery versus cotton candy. I'm going to commit to being the best versus just kind of be okay. And that's only a commitment you guys can make. I can't make that commitment for you. Only you can make it. Okay? So this is your plan for the next 90 days. Let's take action on this plan and increase the probability of selling something. And you don't have to do it exactly the way I drew it up, but, but you can get all this stuff in in a week, I guarantee you. I don't, I don't, I'm not on the phones longer than more than typically an hour to two hours a day. Okay? I'm servicing customers just like you are. You're one of my customers. I'm with you today, so I can't be on the phone. But that don't mean after I eat lunch that I can't get on the phones for an hour and work this system. Everybody with me? Will I feel like doing it? No. I won't feel like doing it, but it don't matter how I feel. Because feelings are real, but that don't make them right. Okay, I got to get past the feelings to get into the mastery. Fair enough? Okay, thank you guys for being coachable today. Have a great day. Thank you.